So we are in the eighth chapter of the book of Romans. And we've been working our way through this chapter. And it is a chapter full of some of the great themes of Scripture. And that's why I've titled this series, Greatness. And I hope that you have been overwhelmed with the goodness and the greatness of our Lord as we've studied through this together. We've learned so much about how we have no condemnation status and how we are sons and daughters of God and how this world of, of groaning, we have a Holy Spirit who intercedes for us and a God who is making all things work together for our eternal good. And what we're going to see today is that Paul gets to a place where most preachers don't like to admit that they get to, where he's almost out of words. And he's going to say, what can we say in response to this? And we're going to see what he has to say, and we're going to do that over these next two weeks. And it's greatness. But let me start this way with a story about a boxer named James Tillis. He was from Tulsa, Oklahoma, but he fought out of Chicago in the 1980s. He achieved some notoriety for his skill, and he, he tells a story of getting on a bus, and, and he had two cardboard suitcases to go to Chicago, and he was going to make a name for himself. He gets off the bus, and he goes right to Sears Tower, and he looks up at that tower, he sets his suitcases down, and he says, Chicago, I'm going to conquer you. When he looks down, his suitcases had been stolen by someone. And it reminds us that many people seem to settle for what I would call a conquered life. Where they just simply try to survive. But then there are people who don't just survive, they, they thrive in life. And it's not because life is easier for them. They have the same hardships, they have the same trials as everybody else does, but they seem to have this, this conquering confidence about them. And it's greatness. Paul had that. We're going to read why, starting in the 31st verse of Romans chapter 8. Read in your own Bible with me what the Apostle Paul has to say. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. So Paul says, what shall we say in response to all of this greatness that we've been talking about? It's hard to ever find a preacher to admit when he is at a loss for words. But Paul is saying, I don't know what words I'm supposed to use, but words are what I've got to use. And he found some. If God is for us, there are words that need to be planted deep into our hearts. Those words are the gospel. It is the good news in just four words. God is for us. You're going to hear me say that a lot over and over as I hope today you make a decision about whether or not you're going to actually embrace those four words, because if God is for us, that is a game changer. That changes everything. There, these are four words that, that reign over anything in your life that's trying to take you under right now. God is for us. Think about that. Who are we talking about? God. Now, 
Every single one of you have been betrayed, maybe by a, a parent, maybe by a mate, maybe by a friend, but there is one that will never abandon you. He is the Almighty. He's the one who spoke and things that did not exist just came to be. It is God that we're talking about. God is, not was, not maybe, not only when you do well, not used to be, but right now, at this very moment, God is for, not neutral, not sitting back saying, well, show me a good reason that I should be on your side. You need to perform. He has already decided before you were even born, he made up his mind. God, the Almighty, is for some of us, the best of us, no, God is for all of us. Those four words, if you believe those four words, they will change your life. And a lot of you don't believe them. You don't believe them because, because life is, has kicked you around a little bit. You don't believe them because you've been the victim of a lot of really bad preaching. We're going to change that this morning. Paul sees no possible shadow of a doubt on this particular matter. God is for us. And that means nothing trying to take you under can conquer. Now that does not mean that we will never have anyone be against us. It does not mean we will never experience opposition. Look at how Paul continues in Romans chapter 8, verse 35. He says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it's written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So he's not saying that you're not going to have anyone or anything be against you. He's not saying that you're never going to experience opposition. What he is saying is that it it is not the opposition that's ever going to be able to prevent anything from stopping God from helping you be who you're supposed to be. God, who is for you, is going to accomplish in you everything that he has started out, his purposes, which are eternal. And it makes all the difference in the world. Is God really for us. They were a nation of slaves. They were, they were nobodies. Egypt was the mightiest nation on planet earth. But God was not for Egypt. God was for Israel. And they left Egypt and they crossed through a sea. The Philistines were mightier in resources and military technology. But God wasn't for the Philistines. God was for the Hebrews. And if God is for you, then Pharaoh and Goliath don't have a chance. Paul says we are not just conquerors. We are more than conquerors. By the way, that word conqueror, it's also translated sometimes victor or overcomer. It's the word Nike in Greek. And so Paul says we're not just Nikes. We are super Nikes because God is for us. Now, if that's true, we ought to be living with a great amount of confidence. Are you? Do you really believe that God is for us? Look up at the screen, this picture. If you're a football fan, you'll recognize this picture. It's from 1969. The AFL Conference and the NFL Conference had just merged years before, and they started a game called the Super Bowl. The older, experienced NFL had always won by very big scores. No one thought that the AFL teams were, were ready to play in the big game. And this quarterback named Joe Namath, he takes his team, the Jets, representing the AFL to the Super Bowl, and he doesn't just say, we're going to play well. He guarantees that they're going to win, and they did. 
They pull off what was considered to be one of the greatest upsets in football history. And when he runs off the field, he's holding up his finger as if to tell the entire world, I told you, I knew that we were going to win. Wouldn't you like to live like that? With, with that kind of conquering, overwhelming confidence? Paul says that you should. You, you should because there are some things that you ought to know. Write this down. God gave Jesus up for you. Now in the Bible, many people are mentioned as being responsible for giving up or, or handing over or delivering Jesus to the cross. Judas was mentioned, so was Pilate, so was Herod, so were the Jews. Even our own sin is mentioned. Jesus himself said, no one takes my life from me, I give it up of my own accord. But ultimately, God was responsible for delivering up our deliverer. Now I'm going to read a sentence to you, and you've heard this sentence all your life, but today you're going to hear it new. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. It takes just a few seconds to read that. Eternity is not enough time to fathom all of it. God gave up Jesus for us. I don't care much about the worship wars. People like to argue about liking the old songs over the new songs. I like good songs. I like songs that have theological depth. A song is not good just because it is old. I'm, I'm sorry, but do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me is not a Christian classic. Some of the new songs are just as theologically trivial. But every now and then, somebody writes a song that is so gospeled it it gets sung for ages and when I think that God his son not sparing sent him to die I scarce can take it in that's what Paul is saying how do you put that into words what is good enough to respond to that that on the cross, my burden, gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. And Paul says, if God would do that, will he not graciously give all things to us? That doesn't mean you're going to get a Cadillac if you ask for it. That means what God is going, what is God going to keep from you that you need to conquer and become the person in Christ you are destined to become? God gave up Jesus for us. So why are so many of us still trying to convince God to be for us? Hasn't he made that clear? Look what Paul said three chapters earlier in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And it is right here that the spirit of condemnation must be met and challenged and conquered. God did not declare you righteous because of what you have done. So he's not suddenly going to declare you unrighteous because of anything that you do. God gave up Jesus for you. God has ruled. There is no higher court. And the judge is for us, who will bring a charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? When God justifies, you can be confident that you stay justified. We are uncondemnable. Because to condemn, God would have to forget and undo everything he did when he gave up Jesus on the cross. Is he just going to forget about the cross? Is he just going to overlook the resurrection? 
Sin cannot change your relationship to God. So stop letting it change your confidence in your relationship to God. Yes, I stumble. Yes, I fail to be all that I ought to be, but I don't have to worry if God has my back. Because God put all of my condemnation on Jesus' back. So I rest in this that Jesus was given up for us. He was also lifted up for us. He was raised up for us. Look at verse 34 again in Romans chapter 8. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. I know that. I know that not only did God give up Jesus for us, also Jesus speaks up for us. He didn't return to heaven to retire. He returned to heaven to represent us. He, the only one who lived a perfectly righteous life, the only one in the universe who has a right to condemn is instead our defense attorney. Look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24. For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence. And he never lost a case. Jesus lives to guard what he died to grant. So every time we sin, every time we stumble, Jesus is there speaking for us, reminding the Father of the righteousness that He has given to us. So now the only way to experience God's againstness is to reject the very gift that He gave to prove His forness. Something that I would like us to do is to begin considering an answer to this simple question. Who is your one? Who is the one person in your life that you know needs to know that God is for them? Oh